Welcome, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Jelani Nelson today give us the TCS Plus talk. So before we start, um, let me first thank the other organizers, so Dedra Gavin and India, and India Day, who are here, also Clément Canon, Kotan Kamat, and Ilya Rosenstein, who are working behind the scenes. Um, we have a number of groups joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. So there's uh, an India Day joining us from Northwestern. Um, then we have Arpit joining us from, I think, Hyderabad, IIT Hyderabad. Uh, yeah, they're saying kind of, yeah. Okay, welcome, guys. Um, uh, then there is uh, a group from UCSD with uh, Jiapeng Zhang. Then there is, I think, uh, someone from Colombia, Kailash, a group from Colombia. Uh, hi, welcome. Um, oops. Then Shravas Rao is joining us uh, with a group from NYU. Sina is joining us from a group from University of Michigan. Srinivasan is joining us with a group from CWI. Welcome, everyone. Um, then the, uh, we have Janish joining us with a group from Caltech. And just joined us, Dimitris Papas, uh, with a group from, uh, sorry, because you just joined us, so I'm not sure where you guys are from. I lost track. Um, from University of Wisconsin, welcome. Okay, so before we start, also I just want to remind you that the next talk two weeks from now will be given by Josh Alman on uh, joint work with Ryan Williams on um, matrix uh, rigidity. So today it's a pleasure to have Jelani Nelson from Harvard. Um, Jelani got his PhD, MIT 2011, I think, uh, with, uh, advised by Piotr Indyk and Eric Domain. So that's like a, a beautiful combo if you're interested in uh, high dimensional geometry uh, and probability, which I think Jelani uh, is. So he's had many outstanding uh, contributions in, uh, you know, uh, um, metric embeddings, uh, sketching, uh, streaming, um, high dimensional probability in general. Um, he's also had too many awards to list. Uh, Jelani, congratulations for the recent uh, presidential early career award. And I think this was before the presidential election, or at least it was probably decided before. So um, congratulations on that. And uh, so Jelani is going to tell us about uh, optimal uh, lower bound for the Johnson Lindestrauss lemma. All right, yep. Are you ready for me? I think so. Everyone ready? Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, yes. Yeah, so I will talk about this work, which is with Casper Green Larson. Uh, we prove an optimal lower bound for the Johnson Lindestrauss lemma. And I'll also give you. I'll start off by giving you some, you know, history of of the JL lemma and other results uh, kind of leading up to this. Okay, so this is what I'll call the metric johnson lindstrauss lemma, usually called the johnson lindstrauss lemma. I put the word metric just to distinguish it from something I'll say on the next slide. Um, it says that for any endpoints in Euclidean space, you can map, there is a map uh, from that set of points into m-dimensional Euclidean space uh, where all the distances are roughly preserved. So I wrote here, if you want distances preserved up to 1 plus epsilon, then um, you can set m to be 1 epsilon squared log n. And this has had a number of applications in uh, computer science. So for example, if you're, if you're dealing with algorithms for high dimensional data, say it's, let's say nearest neighbor search or clustering, k-means clustering or what have you, um, you, know, you first pre-process the data using such a map. Now it's lower dimensional, so presumably whatever algorithm you were running before runs faster. Um, this kind of approach has been useful recently for like randomized linear algebra algorithms. Um, it's been useful in compressed sensing and, and also uh, many other uses that I that are kind of running off uh, the end of this slide. Um, but, so that's that's the JL lemma. And how do you prove the JL lemma or the metric JL lemma um, via something that I'll call the distributional JL lemma, which was proven implicitly in the same paper uh, by J and L. And it says that for any epsilon and delta, there is a distribution over matrices, I'll call this distribution D, such that if you set the number of rows of the matrix to be one over epsilon squared log one over delta, then with high probability, any fixed vector is preserved. Okay, its norm is preserved up to one plus epsilon. And once you have that, you can prove the JLM on the previous slide by setting delta to be very small and doing a union bound over all the difference vectors. Okay, so in fact, the map on the last slide can be linear. F of x is just pi times x, where pi is this random matrix. And there, are, there were some lower bounds known before. 
So JRM and Woodruff had a lower bound, and then me, Daniel Kane, and Raghu Mecca afterward had, had another proof of the same lower bound, saying that DJL is optimal. Okay, so you need that many rows in your distribution. As long, you know, the min of that and, and the original dimension, because obviously you can also just use the identity map. Um, so once, one, one, once uh, these parameters are too small, epsilon and delta, the identity map becomes optimal. But up until that, this is optimal. Um, no Go Alone had a paper for uh, MJL, metric JL lemma, which says that you really do need one over some squared log n up to this log one over epsilon factor. And then Casper and I showed that if f has to be a linear map, so you're allowed to see the data set x, okay? And then you're allowed to pick a linear map based on the data set. It doesn't have to be a random linear map, okay? So there are point sets such that no matter what linear map you choose, you really do need one of us on squared log n dimensions, okay? And uh, in this talk, what I'm gonna focus on is what we did afterward, we removed this restriction. So more recently, Casper um, and I showed that in fact, there are point sets where you just need, you simply need one of some squared log n, regardless of whether f is linear or not. Okay, so I'm going to cover the entire proof in this talk because it is quite a short proof, and I'm going to cover more than just the proof in this talk since I have time to do so. I'm going to, you know, as I said, talk about the history of the lemma and other surrounding results. Okay. Um, so this is the, the statement of our theorem. Okay. So for any integers, d is the dimension of the point set, n is the number of vectors in the point set. And as long as epsilon is not too small, there exists a point set such that any embedding, whether linear or not, with distortion one plus epsilon needs to map into dimension one plus squared log n. And you do need some kind of restriction on epsilon because you can always achieve m to be d, right, by the identity map. And you can always achieve m to be n minus one. So you translate, as I said on the slide, one vector to zero. Everything lives in an n, one, n minus one dimensional subspace. So you can like rotate that subspace so that the subspace is the span of E1 up to EN minus one, and then you just project onto those first N minus one coordinates, okay? So you can always achieve M to be either D or N. So you're never gonna prove a lower bound better than the min of D and N. So um, you can only hope that the JLM is optimal when one over some squared log N is less than min ND. And this theorem assumption is basically saying you know, assume that you're like slightly polynomially smaller than min nd, okay? So as long as you have this slight gap, um, the JLM is optimal, okay? Okay. And so why did this, uh, why did it take so long to prove the lower bound? As you're gonna see, the lower bound that I'm gonna show you is, is a very short proof. Um, and it, it took, you know, 30 something years to, to get it. Why? Um, I'm not sure. That I don't have the, the, you know, the best answers to give you, but one, one answer I can say, one thing I can say is all previous hard instances were incoherent sets of vectors, and I'll tell you what that means, and I'll tell you why there are limitations to, to proving lower bounds via incoherent sets. Okay, so incoherence, what is, what is the definition? So the definition for this talk, there, there's another definition that also, you know, there's another incoherence that gets used when people talk about, say, dictionary learning and compressed sensing, um, or, or Dictionary learning and um, what's that? Matrix completion um, that deals with the leverage scores all being small. That's not what I mean. So for me, what I mean by incoherence in this talk is a collection of vectors is incoherent if they all have unit norm and they're nearly orthogonal. So all their dot products are at most epsilon in magnitude. Okay. And actually, what Nogo alone showed is that any epsilon incoherent collection of n vectors must live in dimension that's large. Again, min, so min of n, because they always live in an n-dimensional subspace, so you're not gonna prove a lower bound better than n. But min of n and this, one over some squared log n over log one over epsilon. Okay, and the reason that's connected to the johnson linus lemma is, well, if you just expand, so let's say that vi and vj have unit norm, as I, well, they do, as I said. If you expand the square distance between vi and vj, that's two minus twice the dot product, and the dot product is about epsilon, so that's roughly two times one plus or minus epsilon. So if you were trying to do JL on this set of vectors, namely zero, E1 up to EN, JL has to preserve all those distances, okay? So first of all, JL has to preserve the distances to zero, which means that all the EIs have to have, and you can assume that whatever map you're using maps zero to zero because you can translate a map any way you want and it won't affect distances. So whatever map you have, oh, so I said it here, okay. So, so map zero to zero and then set F of EI to VI, 
and now you, you have your simplex distances preserved up to one plus epsilon, okay? So if you have an incoherent set, you have jail for the simplex. So a lower bound for incoherent sets implies a lower bound for jail, in particular for the simplex, okay? Um, okay, so, and as I mentioned, uh, so alone did this lower bound this way. Casper and I had a lower bound for linear F, and we did not um, prove our lower bound for the simplex. We proved our lower bound for a different hard set of points, okay? Our hard set of points was the following. So x will have the simplex together with roughly d cubed independent Gaussian vectors. And we can show that this set, this is a probabilistic method, we show that this set is hard with high probability. Hard meaning there is no good linear embedding with high probability. And it's also incoherent with high probability, okay? So this is another example of a hard set that was incoherent. Um, and the, the, the next thing I want to note is that Okay, so here are, here are a couple of different lower bounds that were for incoherent sets. And one thing I want to note is that any incoherent set can be embedded into another incoherent set by just, you know, mapping. Let's say I want to, let's say I have some incoherent set of vectors x, and then I have some v1 up to vn, which is incoherent as well. I can just map the first vector in x to v1, this, the next vector in x to v2, et cetera, and that will preserve the distances, okay? And that's not a necessarily a linear embedding, because I'm just arbitrarily sending people to these VIs. That's not linear. But the point is, um, incoherent sets can get mapped to other incoherent sets, OK? So um, and, and that's going to be important, because the point is, as we're going to see in a couple of slides, there are um, incoherent sets that beat JL once epsilon is small enough. So it's not, so alone. No, you know, it might even be the case, given the state of knowledge of things right now, it might be the case that Noga Lone's lower bound that I've highlighted here is optimal. Okay? It might be that there actually do exist epsilon incoherent sets uh, in dimension 1 over some squared log n over log 1 over epsilon. Um, I'll say something in a few slides. We can actually beat JL. We can't, meet, we can't match Alone's lower bound, but we can beat JL when epsilon is smaller than a certain threshold. Um, so you know, we have to basically get away from incoherence. Um, if we want to prove the optimal lower bound, but um, so good. So let me let me show you though how Lowen's lower bound works because it's it's a very short it's a very short lower bound. Is that a question? I hear something. Uh, yeah, uh, John. Yeah, just uh, just to slow down a bit. I'm trying to make sure I understand everything that you said so far. Yeah. Um, so the linear case of linear f. Um, is this? Um, I mean, what what can, what do you know about Lowen's bound for the case of linear f? Alone. So, if if you're doing J, if you're doing um, JL on a linearly independent set of vectors, then without loss of generality, your embedding can be linear. So, um, alone's lower bound on, uh, for the simplex works for um, nonlinear embeddings, but really the first step in the proof can be, oh, you have a nonlinear embedding. Well, therefore, there's a linear one, um, right? Because you can you can you can create a matrix. So, if first of all, whatever embedding you have for the simplex, you can assume that f of zero is zero because you can translate the embedding, and then you can create a matrix whose ith column is the embedding of e sub i, right? And this matrix acts on the simplex just as your original embedding did. I, I think there was another thing. Was confusing here that uh, I mean it's all very simple, but uh, yeah. I'm still confused by that. Did you say the simplex saying zero maps to zero, but if you want to preserve distances to zero, you need to add zero as a point in your set, right? Zero is a point in my set, so I put zero here. Okay, so you're saying that the lone example is to take the set zero e one up to e n. That was a lone's example. Yes, that's right. Okay, it was very clear. Okay, so uh, good. And what he proved is that. Any epsilon coherent connection, which is the image of such a set under an uh, epsilon distortion mapping, right? That's, yes. That must live in high dimension. Yeah. So technically, if you know, if you do a JL embedding on this point set zero up to e, zero e one up to e n, then since the distances to zero are all preserved, all the vectors v i have to be norm one plus or minus epsilon. Okay. And since you preserve distances between e i and e j. You can do some arithmetic to show that that means the dot products between vi and vj have to be at most you know, o of epsilon. Now you can take those vi's, 
and scale them by their norms to have exactly unit norm. And you're not going to actually change their distances by much. So the dot products are still O of epsilon. So you can obtain an incoherent set of vectors from a, any JL embedding of the simplex. And you're saying for the improved bound you had with Darson? This one? You, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's we took some other. We took some other set of hard vectors. It was not the simplex, True. because in fact, for the simplex, uh, you can, as I mentioned, you can beat um, you can beat JL once epsilon is smaller than something. We're going to see that in a second. JL is not optimal for the simplex. Let me just say that. Okay. Uh, so Jelani, just to clarify. The reason that you cannot do this simplification from any, uh, you can assume that the map is linear in your work with uh, Larson is that you do not have a set of linearly independent vectors. Yeah, they're definitely not. Yeah, they're yeah. definitely not linearly independent because there are d cubed of them. Okay. Okay. There are d cubed vectors in R D, so they're definitely not linearly independent. Yeah, but since they are incoherent, there is a nonlinear embedding following the note, the last note here, namely. You know, map the first vector in our hard set to, to V1, map the second vector to V2, et cetera. Um, and that will preserve the distances, but, and it's not a linear embedding. Okay. Um, so, that, that, so even our hard example for linear embeddings is not hard for nonlinear embeddings. OK, so, so uh, shall I continue? OK, I can't hear anything, so. I think you can go ahead. Yeah, okay, thanks. OK, good. So, okay, good. OK, good. So let me sketch no, uh, no go loans lower bound. So his proof sketches as follows. OK, so, any, so it says any epsilon incoherent collection of n vectors must have large dimension. So let's put those incoherent vectors as columns of a matrix A, OK? And let m be A transpose A. So mij is the dot product between vi and vj. OK, it's the gram matrix, OK? So it's one on the diagonal, because everything has unit norm. And it's at most epsilon off the diagonal. And then he just does some Cauchy-Schwartz. He says, well, since m has rank at most m, it has at most m non-zero eigenvalues. OK. <clears throat> um, so, so right, there's some Cauchy-Schwartz that you can do here. The sum of the lambda i's is the trace, which we know, which we know is n. Um, and you can do Cauchy-Schwarz to bound that by the sum of the squared uh, eigenvalues. And you, you move things around, and now you get a lower bound. Rank of m is at least something. And in particular, um, rank of m is at least n over 2 if you move things around if epsilon is small enough. In general, epsilon might not be small enough. OK. So what he does is he takes m, and he does an intrawise powering of m. He raises everything, every entry in M to the kth power for k chosen as follows. And then that's the matrix M prime. And all the off-diagonal entries in M prime are at most epsilon. OK? So now you can apply this to M prime. So you get that the rank of M prime is at least n over 2. But you can show that the rank of M prime is bounded by the original rank of, of the matrix M. It's at most the original rank plus k minus 1 choose k. And if you take logs and rearrange, you get a lower bound on M. So M has to be end up, ends up being at least something. Okay, so that's that's basically where his lower bound comes from. So it's very short. Is that, <clears throat> sorry, Jelani, that last inequality there is that um, obvious, or because you're taking entry-wise powers, it's not clear at all. Yeah. So I guess what you can. Yeah, you can. Uh, I don't want to spend time on it because what, what we end up doing is not, is not really that related to this. I, I just okay. want to show this to show a contrast of, of, of our approach, but it is not that hard. I mean, if you have Basically, if you have a basis, um, you know, what does it mean to have rank m? It means that you, you can write down a basis for the row space. And you, can, you, know, you can basically choose. Um, it's not hard to get from there to a basis for the row space of m prime. Um, and the number, of, the number of elements you need in that basis is some stars and bars kind of counting. So I, I'm not going to spend time on this. But yeah, it's not hard. You can look at this paper if you want. It looks like I mean, you're basically by um, powering the entries of a gram matrix. It's like tensoring the vectors with themselves, right? Yeah, I guess I've, I've seen this called the tensor trick. So maybe that's oh, uh, why. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I and the tensor is in symmetric space. That's why you get 
uh, the slightly awkward. Otherwise, oh, okay. if you're not careful, you would just get M to the K, but it's slightly different because of the... Yeah, I mean, so an entry of, an entry of this matrix is VI dot VJ to the Kth power, right? So you can expand VI dot VJ to the Kth power, and you get a bunch of monomials, right? And then, um, and then now, like, basically, you have to look at how many different types of monomials are there um, that, that appear, that, that are necessary to sum up to, to these entries, right? So... Um, yeah, it's it's not something hard actually, but let me not spend time on it. Okay, so okay, good. So that's the lower bound and the upper bound. Um, so I want to point this out. So alone, it's you know alone mentions somewhere in his paper. Oh, by the way, like there are there are better upper bounds than random than you know than JL basically by using codes. Um, and then if you want to see details, you know we we we. We kind of write out the details of what he meant, or what I think, what we think he meant uh, in this paper um, with Hui and David uh, Woodruff. Uh, but basically, what I want to point out is, if okay, for any epsilon, there exists a collection of n incoherent vectors in R m, where m is this thing. And the, the what I want you to take away from this is, for example, if epsilon is one over n to the point one, so if epsilon is one over poly n, log n over log one over epsilon is a constant. Okay, so this just goes away. This thing goes away, and what you're left with is one over epsilon squared. So there is a regime where this beats JL. What JL would be one over epsilon squared log n. This is one over epsilon squared times some other ratio squared, but this ratio squared can be less than log n when epsilon is small enough. In particular, if epsilon is smaller than two to the root log n, you can calculate it and convince yourself that this thing is better than JL. So JL is definitely suboptimal for the simplex when epsilon is small. And it's definitely suboptimal for incoherent sets when epsilon is small, because you can use this upper bound. Okay, um, okay good. <coughs> so because this is also short, I'll tell you how to prove this. It's not hard. Okay, so how do you prove this upper bound? Um, okay, so how do you obtain an incoherent collection in general? There are several different ways to do it. One is, you know, use JL. Use, J, you know, use JL in the simplex, get a random matrix. That gives you an incoherent set. There's another way to do, to do it, which is to use error correcting codes. Okay, so, I'll, and I'll, do a, I'll draw a picture and give you an example so you see what I mean. But take a code with alphabet size Q and block length T such that there are N code words and the relative distance is 1 minus epsilon, which means you take any two distinct code words, they only agree on, a, on at most an epsilon fraction of the entries. Okay. And for each code word, the ith code word, we're going to make a vector vi, okay? And the dimension of these vectors is going to be alphabet size times block length, q times t, okay? Um, and maybe it's better that I do a picture than have this text. So here's a picture, okay? I think the picture will explain what I mean. So suppose we have q being 4. So that means each one of these symbols in the code word is between 1 and 4, okay? And t is three, so the number of symbols is three. So this is, ci is a three-dimensional, is, is a three-tuple. Okay. Then the way that we create a vector from this code word is, as I mentioned, the number of dimensions is going to be q times t, and we're going to imagine the rows, uh, the entries in this vector, as being broken up into t blocks, each of size q. So here there are three blocks, each of size four, and we just put a one corresponding to kind of what 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 the entry is and uh, what the value is in that entry of CI. So the first entry in CI is a one. So we put a one in the first entry. And then this is a one as well. The second entry is a one. So we put a one in the first entry. And here we have a three. So we put a one in the third entry. Okay. So each block has size four because Q is four. And we put a one to identify what's actually in that entry of CI. And then we scale it by root T. One thing to observe is, they're exactly t1s in this vector, and we divide by root t. So the norm of this vector is 1. Okay? And if you look at the dot product of two different vectors, it's just the fraction of coordinates on which ci and cj agree, which is at most epsilon. So if you have any such code, you obtain um, an incoherent collection of vectors. Okay? So codes of relative distance 1 minus epsilon give you incoherent collections of vectors. So, uh, Johnny? Yeah. Okay, there's a question from uh, Guy Kindler. Um, can you tell us what happens if you take random vectors? 
Yeah, you get JL. Oh, well, random vectors like what? Like Gaussians? Yeah. Like you, you'll get you'll get one on squared log n as m. You'll basically get JL again. So okay. How how come this is better than that? Why is why is this better? Yeah. It's not better if you take okay. So it depends on what code you use, right? So if you take a random code, like take your alphabet size to be one over epsilon, take your block length to be one over epsilon times log n. So that's basically codes meeting the GV bound, the Gilbert Varshamov bound. You'll it'll work out and you'll get one over epsilon squared log n. So GV codes will give you exactly the same thing as JL. But the point is, once epsilon is small enough, you can beat GV codes. So GV codes are not uh, always optimal. So I mean, I'll, I'll, you'll see that on the very next slide. Okay. So maybe I'll just so I continue. Any? Um, yeah. Makes okay. Go. So so yeah. So let's let's see what kind of code will give you this. And the the answer is Reed Solomon codes. Okay. So what exactly are Reed Solomon codes? So code, so you have some field, finite field, FQ. And code words are indexed by degree d minus one polynomials. Okay. And what's a code word? A code word is just the code word corresponding to a polynomial P is the evaluation table of P. So I'll write P of X for each X in the field. So that means the block length itself is the field size, because I need to write down Q values here to give all the different evaluations. So T is equal to Q. So m is going to be t times q, which is q squared. Okay, and then now, you know, p and p prime agree on less than d coordinates because their difference polynomial has a, has less than d roots because its its degree is less than d. So the relative distance is one minus d over q. And remember, we want the relative distance to be one minus epsilon. So we want d over q to be epsilon. So what do we want? We want d over q to be epsilon. So d is epsilon q. We also want to have enough code words, right? Because we get one vector in our collection, in our incoherent collection, per code word. We want n vectors, so we need to have n code words. Well, the number of polynomials is q to the d, because there are d coefficients for the polynomial you need to choose. We just said that d was epsilon q, so q to the epsilon q has to be at least n. And if you just do a little arithmetic, you can convince yourself that that means q should be this. 1 or epsilon log n over log log n plus log 1 or epsilon. Okay? And m is q squared, so you get exactly what I said above. Okay? So read Solomon codes give you this, which beats random codes once epsilon is small enough. And I even wrote that here. If you take a random code with these parameters, the turnoff bound, for example, implies that you'll get a good code, relative distance 1 minus epsilon. You'll have n code words. Um, but that's worse than read Solomon codes uh, when epsilon is small enough. Okay? So yeah, so but GV gives the same, this Gilbert Varshamov bound gives you the same bound as JL. Okay. So so okay, good. So that's that's where we're at now. Okay. And then now I want to get to how we actually prove our lower bound. Okay, so the moral of all this is incoherence uh, is not the answer to get optimal JL lower bounds. Um, let me pause I'll pause for two five seconds. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so let me keep going. Okay, so let me go back to the main story. Um, so there were different previous works that had different hard sets. They were all incoherent, but we know that JL isn't optimal for incoherent sets because of Reed Solomon codes, for example. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, just, just, uh, I just, you keep saying that, so I want to make sure I'm not yeah. missing anything. Because you keep saying the previous works did have, they all were incoherent, but they're actually just a set of the orthogonal vectors. They're all um, incoherent. Well, incoherent uh, orthogonal vectors are like the best. An orthogonal basis is just as incoherent as you can get, right? But um, for example, like the paper I had with Casper, it was a bunch of random Gaussian vectors, and you can prove that that's incoherent with high probability. Or, um, you know, I described the JL lower bound. I described Nogo Lone's lower bound as being for the simplex, but also, as I mentioned, his lower bound is really for any incoherent set. So. If you just say the lower bound is for the simplex, that couples d with n, right? Because for the simplex, n is equal to d plus 1, because you have the 0 vector together with e1 up to ed, right? So what if you want to have a lower bound where n is not necessarily dependent on d? Like, I want to have, I want to have n being you know, 2 to the d, and I still want to have a good lower bound. I want to have n being you know, d to the log d and still have a good lower bound. 
And you can still get that with Alone's technique. And the point is, um, any incoherent set, you can get, like, uh, how should I put this? If you apply JL to an arbitrary incoherent set of vectors, what you'll get back out is an incoherent set of vectors. Okay? So since, since Noga alone tells you that you can't have incoherent sets in low dimension, you get a lower bound for any incoherent set. Now, how do you get an incoherent set other than the simplex? One way to do it is start with a super high dimensional simplex and apply the JL upper bound to that simplex. Right? So let's say that, let's say that you want to have uh, n set of vectors in RD, and you want them to be incoherent. Here's one way to do it. Um, basically, take, right, so um, as long as n is at most 2 to the epsilon squared d, right, so uh, what you can do is take an n-dimensional simplex, OK, and apply the JL upper bound to it, OK? Now you get them in dimension 1 or epsilon squared log n, and they're incoherent. And uh, d, you know, as I said, n is at most 2 to the epsilon squared d. Therefore, this new dimension is at most d. Does that, I don't know if I answered your question. But, yeah, I mean, uh, that's equivalent to just picking um, you know, that many random vectors in dimension d. But yeah, that's another way of viewing it, right? Yeah, sure. OK, fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think my confusion was really what you said before. I mean, that uh, JL for incoherent set just keeps it incoherent. You could just think of the image and not of so much of the, right, the domain of the function. So. Okay, so uh, are you still confused about something, or? Um, probably not. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Gone, yeah. okay. Okay, so the lower bound I'm going to show you is Essentially, it's some kind of encoding argument or a pigeonhole principle. You'll see it in a second. Okay. And the way the argument goes, this new lower bound, is we're going to define a large collection, uh, mat, you know, uh, script X of n size sets. In fact, they're going to be multi sets. They're going to be ordered tuples, in fact, such that um, if every set of points in this collection of set of points has a good embedding into dimension one epsilon, less than 1 epsilon squared log n, then we're going to be able to encode sets in this collection into less than the number of bits that you need, OK? And that's impossible. So this is some kind of, this is a pigeonhole argument. Um, so let me you know, instantiate this argument. Um, and I'm going to, for now, I'm going to remove this assumption in a second. But for now, I'm going to assume that d is equal to n over log 1 over epsilon. OK, but in, in the end, we, we won't need to assume that there is a relationship uh, that, that n is exactly some function of d. OK, so how does it work? OK, so I'm going to pick k to be some constant, some very small constant times 1 over epsilon squared. OK, and I'm going to take, I'm going to consider subsets s of 1 to d of size exactly k. And I'm going to define a vector y sub s to be the sum over all standard basis vectors indexed by s, normalized by root k so that ys has unit norm. OK? And notice that if you take a dot product of ys with ei, it's either 0 or it's 1 over root k, right? What, depending on whether or not i is an s. OK, great. So dot products tell you, uh, can help you like figure out who's in the set or not, OK? And now uh, script X is the set of all ordered tuples of points, OK, possibly with repetition. So it's not really a set. It's a tuple, OK? Um, and X, my tuple of points, is going to be 0 together with the simplex, together with um, Y sub S for, a, for N minus D minus 1 sets S. So altogether, X has N points in it. Maybe less than n points, maybe less than n distinct points, because there can be repetition. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the SIs, remember, are k size subsets of 1 up to d. Okay. So the size of script X is, well, there are d choose k possibilities for a set S, 
and there are n minus d minus one sets that I'm choosing. So the size of script x is d choose k to this power. Therefore, any encoding of an element of script x needs log that number of bits, which I've written here as roughly nk log d over k bits. The fact that this is one minus little of one doesn't really matter. It's just a constant, okay? But omega nk log d over k bits, okay? And what we're going to show is if for every x in script x, there's a 1 plus epsilon distortion embedding into m dimensions, that fact will imply that you can encode elements of script x using big O of nm bits. OK? Therefore, nm must be at least nk log d over k. And you can, can't, you can cancel off the n's on both sides. m is at least k log d over k. And now remember what k is. k is basically 1 over epsilon squared. So k is like, so m is like 1 over epsilon squared log d over k. And given our choice of you know, what I said, d is equal to n over log 1 over epsilon, as long as epsilon is not too small, this is omega 1 over epsilon squared log n. So this is where the lower bound is coming from. Okay. So the only thing that I didn't show you is why is there an encoding into nm bits? Why does a good distortion embedding into m dimensions imply an encoding? Okay, so that's really the only thing that I that, that's missing from this proof. Otherwise, everything here is formal. Yeah. So Jelani, these these sets x compared to the incoherent sets that you considered before. So um, is there should we think of them in in a certain way? Um, in in terms of is it important what the the different capital S uh, SI sets? Um, what kind of overlaps they have. So I can see that sometimes you have vectors that have, you know, very large inner product, sometimes yeah. very small. You have all kinds of things. Yeah. But is there, is there uh, like sort of an important generic? You're throwing everything in, so, but are there some that are more important than others? So, I mean, um, I guess the way that our proof works, we don't actually identify what a hard set is, like w which, which, which X is actually a hard X. We just know that there is a hard X by pigeonhole. <laughs> But I mean, by this argument, I guess you do know that most x's are hard. Um, so the question is, like, if you yeah. take if you take a random, if you take a random set of ys's like this. Yeah, but what, so that's what I'm asking basically. What are the what, typical overlaps? I mean, it's it might be easy to figure out, but I, there's too many parameters I'm losing. Yeah, honestly, uh, I guess I should figure this out. Maybe I'll let me think about it as I talk, and I'll you know, tell you by the end. But I don't, yeah, right. so <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but oh, okay. I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head. It's it should be not, easy, no? Not, I mean, they said they have size yeah, 1 by 100 epsilon squared. It should, should be pretty easy, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, so I'll keep going. But yeah, this is not, I guess I know that they can't be incoherent. But um, <laughs> so um, they're not going to be epsilon incoherent anyway. But yeah, so good. Um, OK, so let me, I need to prove this to you that there is this encoding. Okay, good. So first, you know, this is this is some very standard stuff, but you know, since since the proof is so short, I have time to cover it, so I will. Um, so first, let me just tell you this theorem from you know convex geometry, which is very very basic theorem on covering and packing, which says that if you have a symmetric convex body K in M dimensions, you can cover it by at most some you know bound number of translations of alpha k, where alpha k is k scaled by alpha, scaled down by alpha. Okay. How do you prove that? So first, you pack a maximal number of disjoint. And what I'm saying right now, this is not novel. You can find this in pretty much like any textbook uh, on the subject. Um, pack a maximal number of disjoint translations of alpha over 2k, okay, such that their centers are all in k. So there are capital N of them. And <clears throat> what you can show is, if you take these translations of alpha over 2k, which form a maximal packing, and then now double them, so instead of making them alpha over 2 scalings of k, make them alpha scalings, you can, you can show that triangle inequality combined with maximality of the packing imply that these translations cover k. Okay? If, if, there were something, if there's something that's not covered, you could say, oh, that, that there's a contradiction with the maximality of, this, of, of these things. Um, OK, so now we want to bound, therefore, the size of a maximal packing. Well, if you take n translations of these guys, well, 
they're fully contained in 1 plus alpha over 2 scaling of k. And thus, they have total volume at most the volume of a 1 plus alpha over 2 scaling of k. But since they're disjoint, the, their, we know what their volume, their total volume is. Their total volumes add because they're disjoint. And their total volume is exactly capital N times the volume of each individual small, small piece. So that means that capital N is at most this ratio, which is 1 plus 2 over alpha to the n. Okay. So, that's, okay, so that's this bound. Okay, so that's this. And corollary, for ex one corollary, we'll, we'll actually end up using the theorem for another k in a moment. But one corollary is apply this to k being the unit Euclidean ball or the radius r Euclidean ball. Okay, so if you have the radius r Euclidean ball in m dimensions, there's an epsilon net in L2, which is the same thing as you can cover it by translations of epsilon times the L2 ball. Uh, and the number of, and the, the size of the net is r over epsilon to the m. Okay, so that's that. That's a corollary of the theorem. And this is what a net means, right? So for any x in this thing, there's a y that's epsilon close to it. So, so now let's get a lower bound. Okay, so our hard set has zero in it, which means that the distances to zero have to be preserved. Okay, and again, we can assume, I can always assume that f of zero is zero by translation of the embedding. So the distance to zero has to be preserved, which means that all the norms of f of x for x and capital X have to be at most one plus epsilon. So the image of x under my embedding lives in 1 plus epsilon scaling of the L2 ball in m dimensions. So I'm going to pick an epsilon net or an O of epsilon net of this scaled ball. Okay. And that has size 1 over epsilon to the m by the previous slide. Okay. And what I'm going to do is for each little x and capital X, I'm going to encode, I'm going to encode it as uh, the closest element in the net to f of x. Okay. And my my encoding of capital X is then simply the concatenate of f tilde of little x for each little x and capital X. So for basically for each point in capital X, I see where the embedding sends it. I round it to the nearest net point. And capital X is the concatenation of all of these. And each one of these is m log 1 over epsilon bits because the net has size 1 over epsilon to the m. And there are n points, so my total encoding size is nm log 1 over epsilon. Okay. And now, why, why can I decode? Why is this a valid, why, why is this a good encoding? And remember that ei.ys is either a 0 or 10 epsilon, depending on whether i is an s, by my choice of k before. Okay. Okay. And I claim that if you know if you know the encodings of points, you basically know the dot products as well. Okay, so one of these x's is some ei, the y, and then you know this x is one of the ei's. This y is one of the ys's, and if you look at the dot product of the net rounded vectors, I can write f tilde of x as f of x plus f tilde minus f. And then now I've expanded out this dot product using distribution. I have f of x dot f of y plus some other junk, but I'm not, you know, I assure you it's not hard. That other junk is O of epsilon. Okay, this, this C is changing from line to line, but it's some small constant. Think of C as 0 0.001 or something. Okay. And now, what is f of x dot f of y by, I guess, Pythagoras? So this is uh, f of x minus f of y squared minus f of x squared minus f of y squared. OK, um, times a half. OK, and remember now what f did for us. f preserves L2 distances. So the distance between f of x and f of y is roughly the same as the distance from x to y. And the distance from f of x to 0 is roughly the same as x to 0, et cetera. So this is equal to this up to 1 plus epsilon. And this right here is exactly x dot y or two, two times x dot y, but I have a division by two here. So this thing is exactly x dot y plus or minus some really small constant times epsilon. So the point is, knowing the rounded net elements for my, point set, for my points in capital X, 
I can still approximately recover dot products. I can, I can approximately recover dot products up to additive epsilon. But reco recovering dot products up to additive epsilon is enough to distinguish 0 from 10 epsilon. OK? So I can know um, for each s exactly which i's are in s or not. So I can recover all of these s's, which means I can recover the point set. OK? So that's the, that's it. OK? So does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Um, which means I can decode which means that the total encoding length, nm log 1 over epsilon, has to be at least the lower bound I said on the last slide, which was log the size of script x. So nm, is at le NM log 1 over epsilon is at least blah, 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 OK? Which means m is at least this. And remember, n was equal to d times log 1 over epsilon. So if epsilon is not too small, this is m is at least 1 over epsilon squared log n over log 1 over epsilon. Okay, which is exactly the same lower bound as no-go alone, but via a very different argument. I showed you no-go alone's lower bound, right? Is this Cauchy-Schwartz comparing trace and Frobenius norm, and then you know based on these eigenvalues, um, and then this tensor trick. So this is this is a very different um, proof, but it's the same lower bound. Okay, but it's not what I promised you because this log one epsilon is still there. But at least now I've shown you what I mean by a proof via an encoding argument. OK, so that's what I mean by an encoding argument. And now in the, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to remove this log 1 over epsilon. And it, again, it's going to be very short. OK. So that log 1 over epsilon, it should not be there. So I'm going to give you a better encoding. Adrian? Yes. Are you going to keep the same x? Yeah, we're going to keep exactly the same capital X. I'm just X. confused um, because well, why is this X um, not uh, incoherent? Well, OK, so we can try to figure it out. So I mean, I guess. Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I thought about it. I mean, I'm not presenting, so I can. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, it's very far from incoherent because this, I think the point is that this epsilon you're using, I had forgotten, but we should think of it as like 1 over n to the 0.49, right? So. So these sets are very large. They have, um, you know, n to the one minus epsilon elements in, or sorry, d to the one minus epsilon elements in dimension d. So I think two of these oh, sets yeah. typically interact in a very large number of elements. So yeah, the inner okay. products okay, are That's much, right. much larger sense. than yeah. than epsilon. Epsilon is tiny, and the inner products of these guys are are hard, are are, are huge. Yeah, that's, uh, that's you, a good point. So, uh, so I guess I'm confused about the parameters because those sets, they're of cardinality k inside d. I thought k is much more than d. K no, no, k is very k is large. One over epsilon squared. And epsilon k. is like one over root n. So, so you, yeah. <laughs> you, you can you can think of you can think of you know think of the case where one over epsilon squared is actually d to the point nine, or d to the point you know sure, d to the point seven. But if it's not, imagine it's not. You know, imagine d to the point one, right? This is also oh, yeah. a valid set of parameters, right? Even even d to the point one is fine. Okay, if if epsilon if epsilon is very large, if epsilon yeah. is say one over log d. OK, then this Reed Solomon example only kicks in as being JL when epsilon is very small, right? So incoherent sets are not bad for us. Um, we don't know that incoherent sets are bad for us when epsilon is very small. OK, so what about epsilon being um, you know, d to the minus 0.1? And epsilon, uh, d to the minus oh. 0.1, um, you know, right. And then I guess, but you're choosing. You're choosing n minus d sets, which is roughly, in this case, uh, d log d. You're choosing about d log d sets. Each set has size d to the point 0.1. Um, the sets will not intersect typically, right? So it's, I don't see the problem. Yeah, in that case, I agree. They, they look like they're incoherent. Uh, yeah, so maybe. Um, Maybe there it is. Maybe our lower bound is even better than I thought. But I mean, then again, I don't know exactly that it is the incoherent sets that are hard. Um, mm -hmm. I just know that one of these sets, a random one of these sets is hard, and a random one of these sets is also incoherent. But simultaneously being incoherent and hard, I don't know. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's true. That, what you're saying makes some sense. Well, you can restrict to only those that don't intersect. That won't change much your entropy. It's still the same number of such tuples, and it's you know, up to very small constants. So. Uh, 
But you could just restrict yeah. your um, calligraphic X only to those where they are disjoint. Shouldn't matter much. Yeah. Yeah. Let, okay. Let me. Let me. Th hmm. I'll think about this maybe uh, in a in a moment. Let me let me try and finish off. Yeah. Finish off the, the argument. Um, all right. So. So good. Um, uh, yeah, good. So this is what we actually needed to know to decode was to basically know what these dot products are between uh, net elements after we rounded f of eis and f of yss. Okay. So let me write let me write this down. So what we need is basically if you take this matrix A, whose rows are f ei you know rounded to a net element transpose. Those are the rows of A. So A is a d by m matrix. Okay. And you take this matrix vector product where the vector is f of ysj rounded to a net element. What you get back is a vector, and this vector is like all the dot products between ysj and the eis. And what you want, and let, let me call this vector vj. What you want is all the different vjs. And sorry, so I, here I said v1 up to vd, that's a typo. The, the number of vs is actually the number of s's, which is n minus d minus 1. So if you know v1 up to vn minus d minus 1, then you can decode. Okay? And in fact, notice that these guys are roughly either 0 or 10 epsilon, or they're within epsilon of 0, or they're within epsilon of 10 epsilon. Okay? So in fact, if you know these dot products up to epsilon, that's still enough to decode. So really, it's enough to recover a v tilde that's within L infinity of, of vj. Okay? So I just need to recover all these vectors up to L, L infinity error epsilon. Okay, so let me write this over here. Um, I have this matrix A. I have these f tilde ysjs and I have these vjs. Okay, so now let E denote the column space of A. A has at most m columns, so the dimension of E is m. Is at most m. And now let me define a particular symmetric convex body, which is this subspace intersected with a scaling of the L infinity ball, okay? So remember that all these dot products are roughly either 0 or 10 epsilon, but they're within epsilon of that. So they're roughly, they're either, you know, they're, they're at, all these dot products are at least minus epsilon, and they're at most 11 epsilon. So they all fit, they all live in this subspace. All these VJs live in this, in this actually, they live in this body K, okay? Jelani? Yeah. Uh, is is it, is the size of the L two of the epsilon L two net uh, substantially bigger than the size of the epsilon L infinity net? Under you mean so an epsilon an epsilon net of L two under L two uh -huh. versus an epsilon net of L infinity uh, under L infinity. Uh -huh. uh, they both are like one over epsilon to the dimension. Uh, but if it's like epsilon net of L infinity. Under L2, like if I, if I want to cover the L2 ball with, uh, I, I'm trying to uh, to, figure, uh, I'm trying to think why like this L infinity recovery will be substantial. Yeah, so if, if you want, so there's some duality arguments here. So if you want to cover L uh, L2 by L infinity, it's it's basically the same thing as covering L1 by L2, and the si and and if you want to do that with parameter epsilon. The size of an epsilon net is something like n to the one over epsilon squared, roughly. Um, but that, that's not what's happening here. Oh. Because I, I'll I haven't shown you the punchline. The punchline is this. The punchline is we don't need to cover k by epsilon k. We need to cover k by k over 20. OK? Because what do I need to recover? I need to recover v tilde i's okay, that are within L infinity epsilon of the vi's. But the vi's already live in this body that's in the L infinity ball of radius O of epsilon. So I only need to cover k by a very small constant factor times k. And if I want to do that, the number of balls I need, the size of my net, is only 2 to the O of m, not 1 over epsilon to the m, which means I can encode each one of these VJs using M bits or O of M bits. Uh, oops, this is not an L, okay, sorry. This is not L2, that's a typo. This should be L infinity, okay? And my V tilde 
um, will be the center of the translation, and it will be within epsilon of vj under L infinity, not L2 as this says, as a typo. Okay, so for the, for each of the set, so for each of these guys, I'll encode using m bits, but I also need to be able to like decode. I need to know what the subspace E is, so I can know what net was even being used, which means I need to know A, which means I need to know these F tilde EIs. But for that, um, I'll encode F tilde of EI using M log one of epsilon bits, as I did on the last slide, or two slides ago, just by using an epsilon net of the L2 ball. So for the EIs, I'll use DM log one of epsilon bits. You know, they're M log one of epsilon per EI, they're DEIs. So in total, that's NM bits, because remember I said that D is equal to N over log one of epsilon. Okay. So in total, this is NM bits. So that's it. That's the entire proof. Okay. And there, I needed to assume that D was equal to N over log one of epsilon for this last bit. If you want to remove that coupling, what if D is not N over log one of epsilon? So you just kind of change the setup a little bit. So here we, did, we had these what I'll call dictionary atoms, which is, which is E1 up to ED. And we have these other special vectors, these set vectors YS. And I could figure out the YSs by dot producting them with the atoms. And here instead, suppose I used a different dictionary, X1 up to X delta, and I defined YS to be the sum of XIs where I is in S, okay? So instead of using EIs, I use some XIs. And what's the property that I really want out of my dictionary? What I want is that for most sets S of size K, if I know the dot product up to small, up to plus minus epsilon, that will tell me whether or not I is in S. That's all I really needed out of this proof, okay? And you can show via the probabilistic method that such a dictionary does exist as long as delta is at most the max of D and E to the epsilon square D. Okay, and if epsilon is much bigger than one over root D, that's basically delta is at most E to the epsilon square D. And the proof is just pick a random dictionary. Okay. And then that's so the summary is actually you get the JL lower bound for heart for for point sets n up to E to the epsilon square D, which is you know the best you would hope for. Okay. So that's how you extend it when you don't want n to be specifically d times log one over epsilon. Um, I think, how, how much more time do I have? Um, you, you're, technically, it's the end of the hour, but um, we started a little late. And uh, I, I don't know, do you have much more? Okay. If no, you I, want to take a few more minutes, it's completely fine. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just cause, you know, less than five, less than five more minutes. Okay, so, sure. so what, what next? Okay, so you can say now we're done. You know, we can go uh, on vacation or something. Um, but you know, unfortunately, there's still more work to do. There's a lot more work to do. Um, so here's one problem. Uh, so static approximate dot product. So literally two days after uh, this jail lower bound, uh, Noga asked us a question, and then he answered. You know, he and Boaz Clartog answered it just a few days after that. Okay. So 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 there, this is their question, and this was the answer. So static approximate dot product. Uh, when I say static, I mean the the data structure's definition of static, meaning that you have a data set that's not being updated and you want to answer queries as opposed to dynamic. Okay, so so the static approximate dot product problem is, suppose you have a set of vectors x in dimension d, and they're all of unit norm, and you have n vectors. You want to construct a, a data structure so that if someone ever says query ij, you can output xi dot xj with additive error epsilon. Okay. And what they showed was they, they basically determined the optimal bit, you know, the optimal space complexity to do this in bits. So if f n d epsilon is the optimal space to solve this data structural problem with n vectors in d dimensions with error epsilon, then um, you know, for this range of d, the best thing to do is this. For this range of d, the best thing to do is this, et cetera. Notice that this is better than JL, because this is bits, okay? JL would say log n over epsilon squared dimensions per point, but each dimension needs like more than one bit. This is n, this is log n over epsilon squared bits per point. Okay, uh, I should say that the first the first uh, in these cases was actually already achieved by Kushilevitz, Ostrovsky, and Rabani, um, but they determined they gave upper and lower bounds for this problem that match up to constant factors. Okay, um, and the proof was also via a covering argument and in, like, with a lower bound error or. Even their first upper round was via an encoding argument. Um, and, and also, from their determination of f, 
you can also uh, figure out that JL is optimal because if you look, if you compare FNN to epsilon, that's a lot bigger than FN log n of epsilon squared epsilon. And that implies JL is optimal because any point set, any, any set of n points can be mapped to log n over epsilon squared dimensions via JL, via the upper bound of JL. Okay? So if you could map to much less than log n over epsilon squared dimensions, you could do that in pre processing before creating their data structure and get an even better data structure. But they showed that's impossible via a data structure lower bound. Okay, so that implies that JL, that you can't actually go much below log n over epsilon squared for JL. Um, open, there are open problems here. One is what about dynamic approximate dot product data structures with fast update and query times? What about approximate distance query in L2 with relative error? And even there, the optimal space is not known. So Piotr Indic and Tal Wagner have a, a new upper bound that's Certainly within log 1 over epsilon of optimal, but the, the upper bound and lower bound differ by log 1 over epsilon factor there. And again, what about making that dynamic with fast update and query? More open problems. Um, can we beat the GV bound itself? Okay, so maybe alone's um, lower bound is sharp and the GV bound is always suboptimal. Okay, I don't know. Um, what about bounds for L2 dimensionality reduction that don't depend on n, but depend on some, some you know, property of the point set? Can we get some instance-wise optimal, optimal bounds? Um, also, as I mentioned, our lower bound is optimal as long as epsilon is not too small. But if you care about the full range of epsilon, basically our lower bound is this thing that I wrote over here, okay, um, up until like basically min n d. Can you improve that to get rid of this division by log 1 over epsilon? So this, so this looks a lot like k log n over k now, where k is 1 over epsilon squared. And can you get a matching upper bound of k log n over k? That's a very small you know, regime of parameters, basically epsilon right around 1 over root n or right around 1 over root d. But can you beat JL right around, you know, right around that, that, that uh, setting? Another problem that I think is you know, probably the mo most important of all of these is can you get a JL map that can be applied to any x in nearly linear time in the sparsity of x and the output dimension m? OK, so we have things like fast JL, like uh, I loan Chazelle and follow-ups. They get nearly linear time in the dimension, but they don't get nearly linear time in the sparsity. And we also have sparse JL maps, but they, you know, they also have factors of it basically get one over epsilon times log n times times the sparsity. Okay, so can you get this as I've written here? I don't know. Can you de-randomize DJL optimally? Here's a question Rasmus Pay put, I think, as a comment on some Facebook post. Um, can you get a Las Vegas algorithm for computing a JL map? Uh, not pointers, but points. Okay, so that's a typo of points in subquadratic time. So right now. Getting a jail map is Monte Carlo, right? You pick a random linear map, you hope it works. But if you want to make it Las Vegas, you'd have to actually check the n, n choose two different pairs of points and check that they were properly embedded with small distortion. Uh, so your running time would be at least n squared. So can you get a Las Vegas algorithm better than n squared? Okay, so, so these are some open problems related to jail. So that's all I have for you. Okay, uh, thanks, Jelani. So, um, if there's more questions, um, if Jelani has time to take some more questions. I wouldn't mind quickly uh, just seeing the last slide before the QED. It was uh, a bit too fast. Just to, uh... By the way, if anyone wants to see Jelani's slides even after the talk, they're available on the, on the website right below the, the video for the talk. And this would be an L-infinity, not an L2. That was a typo. The reason you have to encode E is because there's a rotation involved, right, uh, in a sense? Well, <clears throat> okay, so the point is, how am I, how am I writing my, down my encoding? I'm writing down my encoding as basically uh, telling you which net elements. Um, so, I, I have, so I have these VJs, which live in K, and I'm writing, I'm, I have some net of K, like a 1 over 20 net of K under the norm of k, 
So k is a convex body, so it defines a norm. So I have a 1 over 20 net of k in the k norm. And I'm, t I'm encoding these vjs by telling you the closest net element. Okay, But as the decoder, you have to know how to interpret. You, know, you have to know which net I used. And for you to know which net I used, you have to know what k is. And for you to know what k is, you have to know what e is. But e depends on a. e is the column space of a. So you need to know what this matrix A is. So the way that I'm going to tell you what this matrix A is is I'm just going to tell you explicitly what the rows are. And the rows are net elements, right? They're net elements um, in the L2 ball. So I took a, I took a these f of ei tildes um, live in the 1 plus epsilon scaling of the L2 ball in, in m dimensions. So I'll take an epsilon net of that in L2, and I'll round these f of eis to those net elements. Okay, and, and then I'll write and I'll write down their indices as my encoding of A. Okay, so that's a bit confused about dimension here. Uh, dimensions, you're saying so. Uh, e is um, m dimensional, right? Yeah. Okay, but you need d coordinates, right? They'll all to be within plus minus epsilon. E, e is an m-dimensional subspace of Rd. Right. So how can we intersect E with an m-dimensional body there when you define? Maybe you meant maybe the typo there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is a D. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Oh. Uh, did I do something? Did I screw up? Hold on. Uh, but then I need 2 to the d of them. So uh, maybe I should actually do this a different way. So I should have put these as f of ysjs. So can you use the dm of them? No, it's still m dimensional, right? It's just a different body. That's fine. You never use the fact oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. So this is a d. This is a d. But this is still 2 to the o of m because it's an m-dimensional body. There's, are there other questions? OK, if there's no more urgent questions, uh, we can all uh, thank uh, Jelani. Um, up in our own locations. Let me remind you that the next talk in a couple of weeks will be given by Josh Alman from Stanford MIT uh, on work with Ryan Williams on matrix rigidity. And I'll uh, take us off the live now, but everyone's welcome to hang out for, for a little bit. So thanks for joining us and see you in a, in a couple of weeks. <laughs>